Boom! Happy New Year! It's 2024, nothing has changed, we just write a different number on the end of the date. Um, this is the Q&A video for, that, that I announced four weeks ago and asked for questions and I was mildly overwhelmed by the amount of questions that I got, which is, which is of course good because first of all it's, uh, well, uh, that's a very selfish answer. It's good for the for the YouTube algorithm because any interaction like like comments will um, make the YouTube algorithm favor a video. Unfortunately, the engagement is even more important than, for example, people having subscribed to a YouTube channel. It's kind of flipped it kind of flipped away from the um, from the subscribers. Now it's the engagement via comments that drives the the YouTube algorithm. It's um, a mild mess. So uh, that out of the way, um, I I filtered through the questions. I tried to pick a wide array of of topics, and I bundled up as much questions with the same topic as possible. But still, there is only so much time in a two-hour video that I can use to answer questions. Some of the questions will get pressed into individual videos because I think some of them were very interesting topics that I might um, or will handle separately. I will not say which ones because each time I announce a certain topic on a video, uh, I will never get uh, around to do it. <laughs> I learned that about myself already. So let, let's get started with the questions. One question that I got a lot was about my sabbatical and how I'm going to proceed on after the year of sabbatical. And I'm taking this one as the very first question because it really came up a lot. So quick recap, February last year I, I, I went on a one year sabbatical from my day job at Siemens means I can stay at home for one year, get paid three quarters of what I would usually uh, get per month. My, my salary gets a little bit lower, but I still get paid. And also all the benefits like um, health insurance still continues to work on. And I did that to try out how my shop um, operates if I do it full time. And it went well enough, very well, to, to give me the opportunity to quit my day job by end of December 2023. <laughs> Means by 2024, 20, 20, uh, I'm out on my own with the shop and I will see how it works out and if this endeavor will go fine. <laughs> Which is rather exciting and uh, also comes with a lot of added First of all, expensive health insurance and um, safety for when I'm getting old. But I'm looking forward to it. The, the year working alone in the shop has really shown me what I like to do most, working on stuff. And I, 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 I dearly love my colleagues at my day job. They were some of the most amazing humans I ever met. On the last day when I was at the day job, my colleagues handed me a gift, a card, uh, some things and uh, this contraption. This is a 3D printed boulder gym. That's basically me in Lego scale. Uh, got pr pretty close, uh, gray pants, black shirt, not too far off, uh, long hair, yeah, true. Uh, the, the gray is not accurate yet, but I'm going there. Uh, five years and I will look like that. Uh, and yeah, they 3D printed a tiny boulder gym as a, <laughs> as a goodbye gift on company time, which is lovely. That's, that's what... <laughs> uh, thank, thank you. Thank you to all of my colleagues. Uh, I, I don't think they watch these videos, but thank you. Um, and the <laughs> the the, the stegosaurus um, Christmas ornament here is from a beloved friend that uh, gave it to me 
it, uh, the, the dinosaur is here in the shop to take care of me. <laughs> and when you spend so much time with people working on things and solving problems, uh, they grow close to you and, and there are some of, of my colleagues that I can call a friend. <laughs> and that they will continue to be friends even after I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. But uh, this is now a new chapter for me. I'm, I'm, I, will, I will try to make this work. It, it's looking very good. The, the numbers from last year were solid, more than solid. Despite being one month in New Zealand and not having any income from the shop, that was uh, not a problem. And previously, when I had a day job and my own shop, that was not possible. Running the shop on my own gives me a little bit more free time to work on personal projects, work on my social life and also uh, to travel. I was in New Zealand that year and I also was in London for a week, which was really... But both, both trips very different. Uh, New Zealand was a four, four, four and a half week road trip and London was a, a one week, well, uh, walk around the city holiday or a vacation and uh, well I, I enjoyed both. One challenge was um, not becoming a cave dweller. Uh, still still go out and meet people. The, the, the sport I do, uh, bouldering is a very social sport so that helps. You, you meet up at the boulder gym and you, you do your problem solving and climbing different routes together and uh, that, that's extremely helpful. Uh, I have a little bit more time to meet with friends, uh, go to movies, um, tabletop gaming, whatever. Uh, all, all that stuff is, it, ha it has become better. My, my general mood has improved a lot. From, from, the, from being rather grumpy, I have transitioned to being mildly grumpy, which is a huge improvement. Also, I don't have to yell at uh, engineers anymore, which is also nice. So in overall, uh, I've, I've, I feel very good about my decision to go out on my own. I, I can work to my own schedule, to my own... Don't, uh, if I need a tool, I don't have to talk to anybody if I can order it on the company. I'm, if I can justify it to myself, that's enough. I can just order it and, and work with it. That, that's the freedom I really enjoy and that's what I'm trying to pursue from, from, from here on. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Uh, and also you are, you are following along here on the YouTube channel. Despite this, it, it is a technical channel and it's not a, 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 like a personal blog, but well, uh, it, it's hard to keep out a, li a, a mild amount of, of personal stuff from here. Uh, that said, this is not becoming. That said, this is not becoming a travel vlog channel or a barbecue channel or a random what happened around my life channel. So, it it will be still, or it it will be machining centric, of course, and technical aspect centric. Also, this is not going to be an unboxing channel or a. Uh, sponsor tool review channel or whatever this is still a shop that now really has to make money to to keep me afloat uh, to to make me buy food on the end of the month and to buy cat food so that's that one very common question that that I also got was how do you get work in the shop and what was your first paying project uh, the first paying project is easy I got that project from a friend who has a, a small business of his own uh, it was making some rain covers for proximity sensors. There's a YouTube video on it that I will link down in the description. That was my very, very first paid customer project. And then uh, from there it, um, well, I always was very outgoing with my shop and what I make and my, my personal project and I always documented them either in picture form, a lot of text and later then in video. And uh, that's very good advertisement, to be honest. I, I, I didn't do it with the intent of advertisement. I, I just enjoy sharing what I do. But, um, well, people see what you do and then um, 
the light bulb goes on and well that guy could make parts for me one of my very best customers uh, came to me uh, after reading forum posts of me he, he started the email with well uh, reading through your forum post you look like you you are quite pain resistant and like to work with small stuff and have kind of an eye for detail and uh, he he gave smaller projects to me to to work on and that's a relationship that I had uh, for five or six years now and that's that's a really excellent uh, customer of mine we well it's 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 a very good customer customer and engineer relationship in that case because he's an engineer he knows machining he has a lot of experience in making stuff and all the details he has seen a lot and i learned a lot from him i not only from a, a technical mechanical standpoint but but also i learned a lot from him about quoting and just making stuff uh, we worked on really cool projects together uh, stuff that's we have at least one project that's space flying which is very cool for a guy in a shed basically and that's that's really a, a, a extremely good uh, customer of course you cannot rely on one single customer uh, that can, can go south very quickly the if, if I had to say about I, I kind of have two sides on my business I have one uh, the product side of business which is only the precision bench stones that I make and sell that's about I would say 50% personal uh, or private customers and 50% uh, of those go out to companies usually companies buy buy them in uh, small runs like three or five at a time my job shop side where I make prototypes and uh, parts short production runs that's more like 75% industrial or uh, business customers and 25% private individuals that just need a part because they had an idea or something broke uh, replacement parts for machine tools that a hobbyist put in his garage stuff like that and the industrial customers that's that's really the the biggest part of of what i do or um, business customers and that again splits about half and half in big companies uh, corporations and small smallish one to 25 people companies so that's that if if i didn't have this uh this network and this um, portfolio of parts out there showing my work i would have a little bit of a problem to get work i guess there is always uh, places like xometry which is a online platform to uh it's an online quoting platform you as a customer upload your your part files your your 3d solid model and maybe a drawing and you get an automatic or a human made quote back and then we as xometry partners get a job board and we see and we we see those parts and we we get a predefined price and we can put in counter offers for the price on these parts and also counter offer for the lead time on the part and and that's one way to get work but relying solely solely on places like Sometry, uh sounds very dangerous to me i use it just to fill in some niches and if i see a, a fun or interesting part that i want to make uh, i'll take it or put in a counter offer all of those are of course nda parts again just like most of my industrial customers also nda parts you cannot show them you cannot talk about them and you well yeah, nda parts <laughs> uh that's that so getting work is not trivial but uh turns out it helps to talk to people and uh it, it will be fine what is your cat program of choice now i'm about to upgrade to rhino 8 fusion 360 and anything autodesk is 100 percent a void for me so i remember rhino from the days when we did um half-life and quake model or modding uh, Rhino is an extremely powerful freeform modeling software. 
not something that I would think about as a cat package, but uh, last time I used Rhino was with version 3. So my answer, you won't like it. It's Fusion 360. And uh, there is a whole backstory to it. I have a license for a Libre Designer, which is a rather good solid modeling and sheet metal and assembly CAD package. And also I have a license for Bobcam Ultimate Premium something something, which is solid CAM package. It, it works. But the problem is, First of all, it's two separate programs, which is really more annoying than I would have ever anticipated. <laughs> it's really annoying to have two separate programs. Uh, you work on the solid model, you, you, you get it from the customer, you export it or you import it directly into your CAM package to create the toolpaths for your CNC mill or your lathe. But then you notice, well, I need a fixture or a soft jaw. Then you go back to the CAD pack to model up the, the soft jaw or your fixture, then you re-export the fixture with the part into the CAM package and then you notice ah there is some clearance issues, I have to go back and forth and that's horrendous annoying because you usually lose the design tree and the design history of all the individual steps when you uh, export and re-import. So that's extremely annoying and slows down your work process by a lot. And also Bobcam had problems on 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 the toolpath on the speed at which it generates and regenerates toolpaths. I had one part here in the shop that I worked on and Bobcam took about 45 minutes to regenerate the toolpaths. And I was so fed up that I went to Autodesk and I just got the subscription. It was surprisingly on sale as it's like 11 of 12 months a year. So never get the subscription for full price. And Fusion took about a minute to generate and regenerate. Means calculating all the toolpaths for the same operation that I did in Bobcam. So uh, on the same computer. So that, uh, that, that I, I took that as a sign. And also the, the workflow combined in one software package was more efficient. So Alibre and Bobcam were not cheap. That were very expensive software packages. And well, it's kind of, it was not the best decision in my life to buy those two software packages, which were a, a high four figure number together and then to change to Fusion. But that said, Bobcam, I used Bobcam enough to have it kind of paid, it, paid for itself over the time I used it. But it's still annoying that I have this expensive software package and I don't use it because Fusion just kind of works better. Fusion of course has the drawbacks of first being a subscription model, which, well, that's, that's okay everything as a subscription and also Fusion updates constantly and extremely fast. They have a very fast software development cycle and they roll out features stupidly fast. Uh, the second drawback is for me uh, it being a cloud, cloud saving which makes um, project or organization a little bit more uh, you have to go Two, two ways basically or you upload everything to the Autodesk cloud which I don't want to do. I keep for example all the photos. I, when I work on a project I, I, I set up a folder with the customer name and project and date and then in there go all the model files, all the drawings in PDF format or whatever I get supplied. All the pictures I take maybe I, I basically take pictures of every part that I make and also usually during the process of making the parts either to go back for myself to reference, to show them to, to people if I'm allowed to show them and also just to have something on hand to remember in 25 years what I made and how I made it if it comes back for example. It's very helpful documenting your own work. But then you have, that, that's on my hard drive or uh, for example a cloud 
cloud saving service like OneDrive or Dropbox. Then you also have uh, Fusion 360 where you save your cat and uh, the cat file. You could now go and upload everything from the first uh, folder into the Autodesk cloud and completely work on there but uh, I'm that that's I well I, I don't want to do that <laughs> let's say it that way so you always have the CAD model in a separate branch on the on the Autodesk cloud saved that's just you have to be a little bit organized especially if you get uh, revision revised models from the customer then you have to be very careful what's going on so yeah Fusion 360 sorry what is your favorite Star Trek series TOS the original series TNG Voyager um, hmm. as any good movie or series nerd I have favorite 10 of everything so but I would say my absolute favorite of of um, Star Trek of heritage Star Trek which ends at Enterprise I do not buy into the Kelvin timeline or anything that came past it um, for me the favorite series and overall is Deep Space Nine the original series Voyager and TNG TNG is rather low down for no apparent reason but I just like the others a little bit more but I love them all <laughs> I, I can I can go on Netflix and watch whatever Star Trek old Trek and enjoy it even Enterprise I, I I'm one of the five people on on this planet who who enjoyed Enterprise and I wish they had continued the series on the topic of Star Trek Kirk or Picard well why does it have to be an or <laughs> both are in their own right all of the Star Trek captains have have been extremely cool written characters in their own right be it uh, Cisco in Deep Space Nine be it Kirk in original series uh, Picard in Next Generation and all the others my, 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 my favorite captain of course is Kirk but Kirk is not an individual person. It's the it's it's the dynamic between Kirk, Spock, and and Bones, uh, McCoy. These three people are basically one character, reflecting back into Kirk, and and that's what what makes the dynamic of of, of Kirk and uh, everything around him quite quite interesting. Despite the series being extremely old and in some in some ways also. Uh, a little bit dated but so it, it, I still enjoy it despite being very cheesy and bonus answer for not asked question favorite character in all of Star Trek Miles O'Brien who is the hardest working man in, <laughs> in the entire Starfleet and of course uh, Montgomery Scott uh, chief engineer of the <laughs> of Kirk's Enterprise tell us about one horrible location when you burned up the most cutting tools and <laughs> neurons in a single job in canal tungsten kryptonite well um, the most tools burned up probably was machining tungsten pure tungsten for resistance welding electrodes at my day job the the wear on the cutting tool and the material removed from the part were about 50 50 and that was insanely annoying <laughs> in in hindsight wire edm and grinder would be the reasonable way to do it at the time that was i was very fresh when i did that very very <laughs> optimistic let's say it that way uh, we i didn't have specially tooling for cutting tungsten and we just i had just had to make go with uh, regular coated carbide animals for hard machining steels hard cutting steels and that didn't go too well but also we had some some sintered materials which are well it's it's like 75 percent silver ag and the other 25 percent are tungsten carbide you can imagine how well that cuts with regular end mills it's 
It's kind of a brittle material. It's it's sintered powder together. It's it's the the silver powder and tungsten carbide powder sintered together in small uh, pellets, and we made contact surface for electric contacts out of it for prototypes. In 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 the final product, the the final form would be sintered, but we had to modify some for uh, prototypes and. It cuts relatively nicely. You have to be aware of chip out on the corners, of course, because it's a very brittle substance. So you always had to go climb cutting even when you did face milling it. Otherwise, you would chip it out to the side. Uh, keep in mind, we're talking very small parts like five by five millimeter square and small end mills in the two and one millimeter range. But the wear on the cutting tool was insane. It, it just ground down the end of the end mill flat and then it started to rub and you you got uh, problems with thermal expansion of the of the part growing into the cutting tool and getting all buggered up by the uh, remainder of the end mill and also you got burrs and it just was nasty so you had a very short tool lifespan and i ran very cheap end mills for that reason on that project because otherwise you you would burn a ton of money and uh short of a uh, end mill for a cutting carbide i don't think that there are many end mills that would have survived that very well so that is that's a nasty material and also cutting uh, molybdenum for uh, spot welding electrodes that's also um it, it machines okay-ish you can mill it you can turn it 3d surface it it grinds very good and also you can wire edm it but when you mill it and saw it, it tends to chip out because it's extremely brittle material. And uh, also it's very expensive material, by the way. So if you mess up, that's a lot of money in the scrap bin. The, the problem is really the chip out. When you, have, when you run an end mill along the edge and the cutting edge exits while being in the cut, it will take out the chip of the material and it, it look all buggered up. Same if you cut it on a slow running cold saw, uh, the exit side of the saw blade will look like a beaver has bitten into it. You always have to clamp it between two pieces uh, of, for example, cold drawn steel, mild steel, and saw it as a package. Then you get an extremely clean cut. So that's the, I think that's the three most annoying materials that I ever machined. One time we did prototypes out of a sink uh, alloy and they supplied us with ingots, really just an ingot of material and we had to saw it out and cut about, uh, work around the casting defects in the ingots and that was more annoying than problematic but still a uh, pain in the you know what. And also the, the green What's it called? Mortfeld S, which is a, a, a UHMW plastic variant, which is, is extremely slippery. It has this very green color, uh, super green. It, it almost is as green as these plants here. Super slippery, extremely wear resistant. You can use it, for example, in machines as a guide for, for a roller chain or just if you have parts slide over it. It will not wear, it will, everything else will, will wear out before this plastic wears. It's amazing. But it, it machines okay-ish. It's extremely slippery, so if you help, try to hold it in a vise with very small depth in the jaws, it tends to slip out. And also deburring it as bare. Uh, you cut it, you, you raise a burr, and then you run a, a chamfer end mill along and you will just flip the burr over to the other side. Then you sit there with a scalpel and small block plane and try to deburr it. With other plastics you can just use a scraper blade, whoop, whoop, deburr it extremely quickly or you can media blast it with corn cob media and get brilliant finishes on, on many plastics to, to get a, a burr free finish. Not with, with Murfeld S or uh, unreinforced polyamid 6 uh, nylon. Uh, also terrible material. Try to stay away from it wherever possible. I have two electricity questions about the shop. Um, talk about your electrical supply in, your, in the shop and home. With 480, I assume that's three-phase power. 
uh, why are you using inverters? What's the voltage on your single phase stuff? So uh, it's not 480. The, the line power here in Germany is 220 volt single phase against ground and uh, 400 volt between phases. So we have, if it's three phase, you have L1, L2 and L3 and uh, ground or neutral. Uh, between those it's 400 volts and against ground it's 230 volts or two it, it, there is a range a tolerance range in the voltage it used to be 380 volts and 220 then 230 and 400 and there is a little bit of tolerance but doesn't really matter for that purpose so uh, my most of the machines I have are three phase the drill press is three phase surface grinder tool and cutter grinder and the Deckel FP1 are all three phase machines and the spindle of the CNC is also a three phase inverter. The, uh, the lathe is also three phase but it runs off a VFD from single phase because I had a single phase inverter at the time or got that very cheap. I run an inverter because that allows me to have uh, control over the speed. On a normal three-phase motor, the, the RPM, the speed which it rotates, is dictated by the net frequency. 50 Hz in, in Europe and, or in Germany and 60 Hz in the US. Gives us for a uh, one pair of poles or two pole motor, uh, 3000 RPM minus the drag in the magne uh, magnetic system of the motor, it comes out at about 2800 RPM. A four pole or two pair, two pole pair motor is 1500 RPM minus the drag, it's about 1400 RPM, something like that. But those are fixed RPM, you cannot change the RPM of, a, of an induction motor by changing uh, the voltage. If you change the voltage you only change the the overall power of the motor, the, the wattage, which works. Uh, you can change the RPM in, in such a case if there is constant load on the motor. You can do that for example for a fan. If you have a three-phase motor that's running a large fan you can reduce the voltage and since a fan is a constant load within reason with, with air pressure changes and whatnot, uh, uh, the reduced power output of the motor then will result in a lower speed. But that's not applicable to machine tools because machine tools are inherent changing loads. To change the rotational speed, the, the speed which the magnetic field alternates in the stator of the motor, you have to change the net frequency. And that's what the inverter does. That's why the lathe has an inverter, because on the lathe being able to play with the speed in a very fine controlled manner can be helpful if things start to chatter. Also on the CNC you also want to have fine control over the speed to get uh, precise speeds and feeds to get a reliable cutting process. All the other machines don't have a speed control. The surface grinder will get a VFD because uh, super abrasive wheels can benefit from the ability to change the speed and also regular aluminum oxide wheels um, behave different if you for example reduce the speed then they behave softer or uh, freer cutting. They do not really, but they behave like that. And that gives you a little bit more options. Also, if you get in a, you have a certain wheel and it just does not want to behave and it, it wants to chatter on you and bounce and whatnot, you can uh, get, you can move the speed a little bit and get out of a pickle. The Deckel FP1 will also get a VFD, but not for speed control. The, the gearbox on the Deckel FP uh, gives a very good staged set of speeds but I want the VFD for controlled braking and acceleration of the motor because from as the machine is if you turn it on it it really hammers into the gears and I want the ability to run the machine in reverse 
to do power tapping. Otherwise you always have to undo the tap after you did your power tapping by hand with a wrench on the drawbar. You could just wire up the three-phase motor with a reversal switch, hook that up the foot switch and do it that way, but then you get not only the the beating from turning the motor on when going forward, but you also get the reversal hit when the motor changes direction abruptly and you get all the all the impact from from all the, the little bit of backlash in the gears over the entire gear train all the way up to the bevel gears of the spindle and uh, that's just that's just not nice to the spindle so that's why i want a vfd the vfd allows you to ramp the speed of the motor up and down in a very controlled manner and also uh, you get speed control as a free benefit if you if you uh, add a vfd so that's the reason for that uh, and also there is the question of how much my shop the electrical usage of my shop so i'm running light in here of uh, ceiling lights i'm usually not heating with electric power i i have a small electric space heater in here if i'm just in here for like half an hour and i just don't want to have cold feet and we'll just run it especially when the uh when it's cold but the sun is shining because i have a photo uh, a solar system on the roof and uh, um, a battery storage in the basement for uh, storing the solar energy energy uh, then i just use the small space heater so in general when i'm out in the shop for like seven hours i usually come out at between 5 and 10 kilowatt hours a day depends it depends when i run the surface grinder with the shop vac uh, that's about uh, 2 kilowatts per hour with the large shop vac and the surface the surface grinder has only 0.25 kilowatts the shop vac has 2 kilowatts so uh the main <laughs> the main if offender here is the shop back the decal fp1 takes like a kilowatt when you take when you do normal work the lathe about one kilowatt uh power consumption and if you calculate that over an hour it becomes a kilowatt hour of course so usually five to ten kilowatts per day maybe more when i when i decide to run the space heater a little bit to keep my feet warm uh, because i don't want i have a space heater in here which uh, runs off the of the oil heater of the house but when i don't want to heat up the entire shop as i said room heater uh, and also the overhead lightning is a large uh, chunk of power it's led lighting but it's uh in this side of the shop it's 20 40 60 80 uh if i have all the lights on here it's uh 200 watts 300 watts i think uh and that sums up over the day too so uh, i'm constantly running around and turning on lights uh turning lights on and off because well the other side of the shop currently there is nobody i'm not working over there so the light over there is out and also uh i can turn on the lights in this side of the shop where the cat pc and the grinders are uh, half and half currently i have only the light on here and over there on the grinders it's off so saving a little bit there too i try to be frugal as possible because uh, i'm a cheapskate cyber wendy asks I always wondered why you use a 6mm end mill instead of a 10mm end mill, for example. Uh, I'm glad you asked, because that's something that I wanted to talk about forever. Uh, this is the humble 6mm end mill carbide. There's a four fluter. Uh, it doesn't really matter. This is just an example. Why do I like to use these so much? Because these are super versatile. These can do well comes in a six millimeter diameter so you can machine fairly narrow features in general machine building or parts making they often come with a decent length of flute so you can uh, you can cut out fairly deep pockets with them or do slotting also you can relieve them fairly wide before they get flimsy to do even more deep work 
They, on the other hand, they are very capable of removing a ton of material in very short order of time. Uh, I will show that in a second over on the manual milling machine. And also, let's, let's take a look in a tooling catalog. This is uh, Hoffman Group's tooling catalog. That's where I buy a lot of tooling. Uh, this is here in Germany, one of the main tooling vendors. So we have carbide end mills here. A lot of carbide end mills. So let's find a standard a standard three flute uh, full hop metal mini fraser, which is a solid carbide miniature end mill. So let's look at why I like the six millimeter end mill so much. We have the diameter here on the left side, 0.5 up to uh, 20 millimeters down here. And as you can see, list price for a 0.5 millimeter end, end mill is 15 euros 45. And it stays 1545 all the way up to, surprise, surprise, six millimeters. Over six millimeter, 6.75, you suddenly make a jump in the price, a uh, quite significant jump. Uh, that's uh, almost uh, six euros more for 0.75 millimeters more diameter on the end mill. And if we go further, eight millimeters is still 2170. And then when we go over eight millimeter, we suddenly are double the price of a six millimeter end mill, almost. All the way up to the 10 millimeter end mill. And the reason for that is because uh, up, over here you see the shank diameter. Small ones are three millimeter carbide blank. Then you have a six millimeter carbide blank all the way up to a six millimeter end mill. Uh, and then just because carbide is expensive, you have a jump to an eight millimeter carbide blank, which is uh, the first jump in price. And then the 10 millimeter carbide blank up to 10 millimeter diameter end mills, 30 euros. Uh, tw 12 millimeter carbide blank for uh, 11 and 12 millimeter end mill, 41 euro 80 cents, all the way up to 105 euros for a 20 millimeter carbide end mill. So for me, the most economical way to remove material on the manual milling machine is often, in many cases, a stupid six millimeter end mill because it's cheap. Well, it's 15 euros, but I can do a lot of work with a six millimeter end mill. This is just an example, uh, other end mills are uh, cheaper or more expensive. We also have their uh, Holex line. Hole Garant is their premium line in, in quote and Holex is their lower uh, lower tier. But uh, the Holex end mills usually work extremely well. That's something I buy a lot. Uh, they are only 11 euros. In this case they are uncoded. So that's take care of. But um, I have the same six millimeter carbide end mill that I just showed you over on the bench in a collet, very short up. I have a piece of O2 tool steel here in the vise. And to, to uh, answer another question that I got about the uh, speeds and feed slide rule that I use, this is also sold by uh, Hoffman Group uh, under their Garant brand. And it has the number that I will put here on the screen that you can find it in their web shop. And yes, it's useful. Uh, on the front side, you have your. Um, oh, this is. Uh, okay, this is better. You have your surface speed that you want, your diameter of the tool or workpiece, depending on uh, mill or turn. If you want to do, if you want to calculate your. Uh, spindle speed, then you have your tooth count on an end mill and your feet per tooth down here, which results in a feed millimeters per minute that you can either set on the machine or put into your CAM software. When you run a CAM software, of course, most of them can do speeds and feeds calculations on their, on their own. So this is most useful for manual machinists like me. Well, I'm, I'm an all everything machinist, I guess. So. Six millimeter carbide end mill uh, with in tool seal 100 meters per minute surface speed is perfectly fine. That's just an experience 
number or from from the tooling vendor. The tooling vendor will supply you with a surface speed of your tool and you should not crazy exceed or uh, overshoot the surface speed by a lot. You can go slower in many cases but not faster and 100 surface a surface speed of 100 meters per minute on a diameter of 6 millimeters here gives us a spindle speed of 5200 rpm roughly. Of course this machine cannot do that so we have to dial it back to uh, 2000 rpm which gives us in retrospective a surface speed of about 38 meters per minute which is also fine works it's slower and we're on the safe side. We have a four fluid end mill so we we line up the four with the 2000 and we want a chip load for roughing we're full slot cutting of uh, 10 micron 10 microns per tooth which gives us a feet per minute down here of a little bit over 80 millimeters per minute so the machine can do 80 millimeters per minute and we will try that so the speeds and feeds calculator is a very quick way once you are used to it. It doesn't give exact decimal numbers. It gives, it's a, a precision guesstimation, uh, but it's very fast. So let's see, I set it to 2000 RPM, 80 millimeters per minute, and we will take a cut of six millimeter into solid material and see how it behaves. As you can see, you can push such an end mill, and this is not a dedicated roughing or HPC strategy roughing high volume material removal cutter. This is just a straight universal end mill. So uh, we, can, we can push that a little bit further, up to 10 millimeters, I think. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to, I dropped down four millimeters more, so once I end the once I reach the end of the slot, we're taking a 10 millimeter deep cut in tool steel. So that's hell of a wreckage. Uh, as you can see, with very little monetary effort, we just uh, put in quite a slot. Of course, we put a lot of heat into the material, uh, hence the discoloration on the end here. This would be a good idea to run with slot coolant. I just ran uh, compressed air to get the chip out of the slot. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, the humble six millimeter end mill and on the other hand you can run these end mills with a very shallow depth of cut but with a very high feed high feed milling strategy i would run this with 2000 rpm and a feed of 500 millimeter just to do surfacing or hard milling on this machine like cutting 55 or 60 rockwell hard tool steel and then i would just take depth of cut of 0.2 millimeters but with a very high feed of 500 millimeters and the end mill will last very long if we do that and when we look at the chips this cutter created 
These are nice and healthy chips. They, uh, we created an actual chip. We didn't rub it. We, we, went, we took a, a very appropriate uh, chip load. There is, uh, often, often I read fairly high uh, chip loads per tooth on forums like 0 .5, 0 0.05 millimeters chip load per tooth on small end mills and this will uh, wreak, wreak havoc on your tooling. If you look in a tooling catalog in a modern one for, for the tooling we're using here, um, the feet per tooth for a full slotting cut is surprisingly small, small despite what people say that uh, oh, the cutter is going to rub itself to death. No, it's not. Carbide is so sharp it will take a, a very nice chip even with a small chip load if the tool is running true. Did you enjoy your trip to New Zealand? I hope you enjoyed the country I call home. Yes, I will splice in some pictures while I'm talking here. Um, we did uh, four and a half weeks in New Zealand, um, about two and a half weeks on the North Island and then we flew down to the South Isle because uh, we messed up with the ferry from Wellington down to the South Island because we, <laughs> uh, because well, it, well, we're uh, mildly chaotic. So we drove back to Auckland, took a flight to Christchurch and then we took another car and we were on the South Isle. And basically we were somewhere else each day. We, we drove to a nice place. We did what we wanted to do, like climb the Mount Egmont, <laughs> which was the first mountain I ever climbed. <laughs> And I wanted to give up like five times and uh, my travel buddy was like, nope, you're, we are going up there. And well, we did. We went up there. My first, it's a 2,500 meters hill volcano, I think. And it, it was rewarding. It's what worth every second I would do it again in a heartbeat. We just did a lot of different things. Uh, Hobbiton, of course, the, the famous tourist trap. We did the Mount Doom uh, crossing. The, the mountain is of course not called Mount Doom because that's from Lord of the Rings. But uh, we just basically uh, speed run. We did a speed run of Mount Doom in like six and a half hours or something like that. Over the four and a half weeks, we did a, almost 500 kilometers of walking by foot, 5,000 kilometers by car and one inland flight. Flight from Germany to New Zealand is about 25 to 30 hours, dep depending on uh, layover times uh, in Singapore. <laughs> uh, fl the flight back was 30 hours because we had six hours of stay in Singapore. Uh, it was lovely. All the people in New Zealand were so, so friendly, helpful. Every place we stayed, uh, all the hosts, uh, usually we are Airbnb or booking. All of them were super helpful, uh, friendly, gave advice. All the, the people we met in, on, on, in the streets basically or in, in places to, to eat were super friendly. Uh, we did a glow, a glow warm cave tour, which was also one of, it, it stunning, beautiful, stunning. Uh, when all the lights get turned off and you can see on, on overhead the, the glow worms and it looks like a cathedral in the dark that's uh, illuminated by thousands and thousands of tiny glowing spots. Incredible. Uh, we just stopped by random waterfalls at the side of the road and had a swim. We, we <laughs> we got lost a few times because it's us. Uh, it was lovely. I, I would do it. I would, I would go to New Zealand in a heartbeat again. It, it was great. Uh, it was a lot of driving with car. It was not it was not a cheap uh, vacation, I guess. Uh, the flight is expensive. Um, New Zealand itself I wouldn't say it's crazy expensive, but uh, it, it adds up over time. The car 
uh, renting the car was expensive. On the South Isle, we, uh, on the North Isle, we got a car from Sixth, some uh, Skoda semi SUV, which we beat the hell out of. And on the South Isle, we just had a Toyota Yaris Corolla, something like that, that we also beat the hell out of it. Turns out uh, you don't need four wheel drive. Uh, uh, regular street cars are quite off-road capable. <laughs> um, uh, at least if it's not your own car. <laughs> so yeah, it was lovely. Uh, I highly enjoyed it. It was super, it was great fun. Just uh, experience of a lifetime. <laughs> there were a lot of questions about how I quote my work and how I uh, estimate the time. Well, that comes down to kind of a dicks. It's, it's an experience thing. At my day job when I was doing prototype milling, I had a foreman who always challenged me on. We, we always had this game of, uh, I estimate the time for a project and he did estimate the time of a project. And in the beginning I was very off sometimes, but in the end, after I think we worked together for eight years, I got rather okayish at guessing or estimating, estimate the time for a project and the time is the main factor for, for, for building a quote for me. You take the time that you think you will need for the part. Let's say, let's, let's say this, the slave part. Let's say you, you have, well that, that's probably half an hour of slave work for one. Uh, you multiply that with your hourly rate, you add a safety factor, maybe 25%. You add the cost of the material, preferably a stick of material, so you have some material for scrap. Or if it's cut to size material, you, you, you budget in uh, extras for scrap. Uh, don't ask me why I know that. If you ever worked for a buck an hour because you misjudged your materials. Uh, that's a painful experience that will never uh, leave your mind again. So uh, then you add maybe specialty tools. Like in this case I had to buy... I'm not sure. I think I had to buy a ID threading tool from P, from P Horn. You, you budget in at least one and one spare. Uh, this was a run of 10 parts, so you, you budget in the tools over the 10 parts. Uh, again, add a little bit of safety. Maybe you have to buy some gauging, for example, a, a thread gauge, which I had for this project, so you budget in that too. Then you budget in your overhead. Well, uh, overhead like uh, light, power, uh, consumables like regular consumables like uh, inserts for turning, oils for the machines, but uh, I have that kind of baking into my sh hourly shop rate. And the customer in the end gets a part per price in my case. I do not work on an hourly uh, rate for the customer. If you come to me and say you want, you want this small assembly ready to go, with all the hardware, you will get a final price for this piece. Uh, that has the advantage of you kn the customer knows what he gets for how much money and I know how much money I get for how much work. If I did this on an hourly rate, I would have to take, uh, I would have to, to be very cautious about my timekeeping, about um, uh, I have to be fair to the customer, so when I'm on the phone checking Instagram, I cannot take the time, th that time cannot go into the final price. And since I'm a lot, since I'm a very easy, distractible person, I'm constantly on my phone or here on the PC or petting the cat. And for me, it's just more fair and money on, on the clothing. Wave two. 2171 asks, how is the Emco Lathe and are you ever looking to upgrade to a Weiler or similar? Well, let's see. The Lathe I own is a Maxima Emco, 
Maximat Super 11. It's a Austrian made semi-industrial lathe. It's, I would say it's the lowest end of an industrial uh, semi-tool room lathe, I guess. It's really a nice lathe. The headstock spindle bearing arrangement and everything in this area is very well thought out. It's, it's, it's a robust gearbox. Spindle bearings are nice and beefy, but also running very nicely. Uh, the only drawback is that there is it's a geared headstock, so it's, you have the last stage of the of the drive to spindle with a gear. And when you do stuff like diamond turning, you will see the noise from the gears in the surface finish, which can be. I have I have one part where that used to be a problem, but since we don't do the diamond turning on this part anymore, but diamond burnishing. We don't have the problem currently anymore, but my next lathe will not have gears to a spindle. Uh, the drive gearbox is relatively well laid out and works well. We have a separate lead screw and power drive for the power feeds. Power feed lengthwise and crosswise. As it should be, no compound slide. I modified the lathe in a way so I can drop the compound slide in the back here if you need to within two minutes. Uh, the tailstock is great to hold my air hose, which tailstocks are in general best used for. Um, very good chuck mounting system with the short taper spindle nose. Uh, I run a six jaw most of the time and a 5C collet chuck. I have a good digital readout on this machine. So it's really a nice machine. I can hit tolerances all day long that are fairly tight, but I also, I'm, how do you say this without sounding arrogant? I'm quite proficient at running a lathe, I would say. So uh, I, can, I can make a, a rather chunky lathe uh, do nice things but a nice lathe makes it easier and faster. So this is, in my books, it's a very nice machine. It doesn't do, it do it's not a machine for roughing. It, it doesn't like to do roughing very much. Uh, it takes a little bit longer, but uh, for what I do, it's, it's perfectly fine. That said, I'm looking for a different lathe. I want the same size of machine, but with a headstock that has a belt for the high speed range, a belt drive to the spindle, a back gear for a high torque, a beefier bed. Uh, the bed on this machine is not bad. So no, bad meaning the, the, the slide weight, the length slide weight uh, is not bad, but uh, the, the carriage is a little bit on the light side of this machine. The, the length of the, of the guide that's engaged to the bed is, only that long on, on better machines, real tool room lathe that's double, double the length. Goes to cost of, cost of um, distance between centers, of course, but there's a drawback to everything. Uh, a heavier cross slide would also be nice. What, what machines are, am I thinking of? Well, let's, let's have a look at uh, Tony's website. So let's do some high-end screen capture here. My, the machine I'm currently looking or most preferably looking for is this one. This is a Weiler uh, Matador. And in this configuration with the gearbox, gearbox for the spindle speeds. Uh, we used to have these at Siemens in the apprentice shop and these are extremely rigid compact machines it's about the same footprint as the Weiler lathe it has a smaller work envelope but it's a more sturdy machine uh, the spindle is way heavier built the carriage is way heavier it's just an overall a more it's more lathe um, the final drive to the spindle is via a belt drive on this machine this is a true tool room lathe here is a cutaway section of the of the headstock and um, here you can see the double V belt that drives the spindle on high speed. Um, if we find a picture of the headstock here is a cross section. So down here is the very well uh, let's see here is the gearbox version. Down here is the motor then you have the speed selector gearbox 
uh, that's made by Ertling House, which can be troublesome. But usually if they are used properly, they last forever. And then you have, from the output of this gearbox, you have a belt drive directly up to the spindle. Means you don't get any gear noise from a gearbox to the spindle when they're running in high speed. There is of course a back gear option, which, uh, let's see, I think, uh, I'm not 100% sure, and I don't want to think very much right now. Um, the, if, if you go into back gear, the, the pulley doesn't spin, doesn't get connected to a spindle anymore. It transfers power via this gear over this big gear and then over here small gear and then to the bull gear that runs here on the spindle. I think that's that's how, how the drivetrain works in low low speed. It's it has a double double roller bearing in front uh, and a fairly heavy duty axle bearing back here and uh, which is preloaded against with a angular contact bearing even further back. Uh, that's the headstock of the Weiler Matador. The, the, the roller bearing front here is adjustable. It has a tapered bore on the inside and the seat on the spindle is also tapered. So the further you push the bearing on the, onto this cone, on this tapered section here, the tighter this bearing gets. Very expensive bearings, by the way. Uh, that's the feed gearbox. And uh, oh, another, another bonus of these machines is the the feed gearbox, when you don't do threading but only turning and facing, the feed gearbox is driven via a belt of the spindle, not via gears, so you don't get gear noise on the feed either. So these machines are really made to, to do a nice finish. The other Weiler machines, from, from a size standpoint, the Weiler Primus would be absolutely okay for me. But the problem with the Primus is the same as with the Emco Super 11. The gears, the final drive to the spindle is with gear. So you get the gear noise again. There is a version with, um, with belt drive from the motor via jack shaft to the spindle. But that requires you to change belts all the time if you don't want to rely on a VFD for its speed change all the time. Uh, but I would like to have a proper back gear for low speed, which this one doesn't have. So Weiler Primus is out. The larger Weiler lathe also are out. So uh, what are the other options? Another option would be a Schaublin 102 NVM. This is the new version of the Schaublin 102 VM, which is the screw cutting version of the 102. Uh, this is smaller than my Emco lathe and uh, uh, it's already almost too small, I think. It's a high precision instrument maker's lathe. Uh, it has belt driven spindle with a geared back drive or back gear for, for low speed and high torque. It's just smaller. It has a very good collet system in the spindle. But the problem is the spindle, uh, let's see if we can find a pic picture. Um, the spindle nose on these machines, it inside has the contour for a, a collet, but the outside where the chuck is mounted is a threaded spindle nose. And I really have my problems with threaded spindle nose. Uh, that, that's one thing I would like to uh, not have. So I, I think the Shablin 102 NVM, as nice as the machine is, uh, there are some machines that have a cam lock spindle, but those are very rare. So that's probably not going to happen if I cannot overcome my dislike for threaded spindle noses. I know that they work, they have their problems, they have, they work, but they still work. Um, then there is the Shablin. 125 which is a brilliant laid out tool room lathe. This is this is the same size and form factor as my Emco lathe but it weighs about four times as much. 
belt drive and back gear for the spindle. Final drive to spindle is with belt. Electric power feed, finally adjustable, like on a Harding HLDH with the uh, motor on the gearbox. Extremely well laid out, high precision lathe, boxway, boxway design here, which has its drawbacks. You can't have everything. Here is the, the feed gear feed, the feed unit for the electric power feed. And those machines are funny because they don't have a lead screw or a, a power feed uh, shaft in front here. What Chubbly did, did on these machines is, let's see, they have a, a huge, I think it's a 40 millimeter trapezoidal lead screw hidden inside the casting with um, it's, it's hardened and ground and lasts forever. So you, you never see the lead screw and the shoveling machines are made to be like a, a platform or a system. You have all kinds of accessories like an indexing attachment for the spindle. You have a milling spindle that's driven via this Looney Tunes contraption with the belts up here. Different grinding and milling spindles, milling attachments with vices. Um, a rack and pinion tailstock, which is very nice if you like tailstocks. It's still a good place to hang on the air hose. Um, ball turning attachments, standard. Even they even made for uh, hydraulic tracer units for this machine. So the the Schauble 10125 would be a real neat machine. So I would not mind a. Oh, that's the accessories. Um, I would not mind a Harding, Hardinge, Harding, depending on who you talk to. HLVH, I think they're really cool machines. Talking to Robin has made that even more clear. He described in detail how the headstock is built, which is just one massive casting with a hole in it, no ribbing, no webbing. It's just a chunk of cast iron with bore for the two bearings. So, uh, and then you have the, the stupid large and wide dovetail bed, which is hardened. Extremely large uh, area of the, of the saddle acting against the bed. So, um, it would really be a nice machine that the chuck mounting system with the, with the uh, Harding taper, Harding spindle taper looks well thought out there yeah, that would be an option they are super rare in germany you don't find them very often they show up but uh, often in terrible condition and i don't want a project i want the machine <laughs> so those are the the handful of machines that i'm currently considering uh, there is also Boli, leinen uh, hembruck hembruck also has one interesting machine Hembrook. Uh, the Hembrook Ergonomic, which is kind of a funny machine. Uh, it looks like it's it's falling over and it's not. The It's basically a manual slant bed lathe, means that the apron is whoop, tilted to the front so you see better and uh, the, the ergonomics are better for the user. And these machines were built as precision lathes. It should be in the same realm as the Shaolin 125. Very well uh, regarded machines, but also kind of rare. They don't show up very often, but I would not mind one of these. F2D Combat asks, eine einfache Frage, uh, a simple question. When is a cutoff too small to save? What do you do with cutoffs, sell for scrap or recycle bin? So I have different classes of cutoffs. Uh, it starts with almost full bars. Full bar for me means one meter and uh, up to half a meter or something like that. And th then it just gets stored in these pipes. Everything is labeled, of course, because otherwise I get trouble with, uh, uh, with the material and what it is. Then I have like half meter sticks in here. Uh, in here are parts 300 millimeter or material drops 300 millimeter and shorter. I keep those because uh, I can make a lot of parts out of a short piece of 
stainless steel 22 millimeter and also it costs money. I for sure will keep something like this. This is a piece of tool steel 12311 uh, which is very much like P20 plus S uh, a little bit better to polish. Uh, expensive material I will keep that. Uh, or just a short piece of uh, this is like 4140 this stays here uh, also saw and cutoffs of tool steel you can make a lot of parts out of a tool steel block like this as long as you know what it is you can keep it in my mind and then I have a real scrap or cutoff bin In here, back in the corner, I have uh, one of those IKEA uh, drawer cabinets. I have plastic drops in here. I keep a lot of plastics around because sometimes you just need to make a bushing to hold a screw in a in a in a three jaw chuck without damaging it. Uh, many of the plastics in here are also labeled to know what it is. This is a uh, Palm, which is uh, Delrin as a trade name. Uh, this is a piece of PVC. I for sure keep stuff like that. Uh, I, I absolutely keep stuff like this. This is a piece of PEEK uh, with glass fiber reinforcement. I can tell from the surface here that it's a reinforced piece. Uh, same for this. This is a piece of PEEK. Uh, very expensive material. I keep that 100%. Uh, the aluminium drawer is, uh, well, I keep some stuff, I try to, well, I usually mark with a uh, with die grinder the alloy on it, then it's allowed to stay. Sometimes you just need a little piece to make another little piece and then a drawer with material that you know what it is, is fine. Uh, tool steel. Uh, drops of drill rod, 120, 122 10 drill rod. I just keep stuff like this around. Uh, sometimes you just need to make a small pin and then I don't want to cut a piece of a long bar and just grab something out of here. Uh, tool steels and tool steels. And I try to mark what it is if possible. Excellent, excellent sample because this one doesn't show what it is. Great. Uh, this is a piece of 127.67 or stuff like gauge plate. Uh, this is um, a tool steel plate, Blanchard ground and this is uh, also O2. Uh, bronze, copper, I keep a little bit more because this stuff is expensive. Uh, I keep, for example, a dumb small part like this I will keep. If it, if it doesn't have any drill holes and is reasonable square-ish. Uh, or a, a chunk of copper like this stays for sure. Um, stainless steel. When we look in here, I will keep fairly small stuff too. So I will, I will keep fairly small stuff like this small piece of hex. Uh, red indicates, well, it has also engraved what it is. It's um, 14305, which is the, which is a screw machine quality of stainless. Or this little piece here, this is also same alloy, 14305. I just often grab a little piece when I want to try a tool, then I just grab it here. Uh, there are some pieces of mild steel, uh, cold drawn bar that I keep in here, stuff like that. <clears throat> and then I have a drawer with specialty materials. For example, a piece of molybdenum, uh, some Tulox 44. This is some titanium grade 5. 
also a small chunk of Torlon, which is an extremely expensive material. This is a small drop, of course. Some if, if some people would throw it away if it was another material, but I think most people would not throw away a piece of Torlon, which is uh, probably 100 euros in the size. Also, I keep uh, I can't throw away something like this. This is Iglidur uh, J, which is a a bearing material, bearing plastic. But also, I keep a small piece of Torlon like this, a small cutoff. It's expensive material. I can make a part of it out of it that's like uh, three or four figures expensive and uh, with just a small chunk of this stuff. Also over here on the bench I currently have a, a chunk of peak, P-E-E-K, and these are drop-offs from a bigger job that I did a few years ago and beginning of the year I, I had a peak project, out of, uh, parts out of peak which I cannot show but um, this was a high four-figure project and I was able to cut everything out of these drops of PEK without having to buy any material. So uh, that's a very sustainable way for me. But I will also throw away stuff. I'm, I'm very, I have become very quick to throw away small chunks. So for me it's less about the size of the cutoff, it's more about the, the value of the material and how easy it is usable. If it's some weird shape and uh, I, I'm most likely either, uh, if, it, if it's quick to square up on the band so I might cut off corners and make it a square block, especially if it's plastic, uh, or I will just throw it away. With uh, recycling, expensive materials like uh, brass, copper, I collect all the chips and sell them to the recycler. Well, sell them for scrap. Same for aluminium chips. I save aluminium chips and also aluminium drops separately because the scrap place gives you a better price for solid drops than for chips. And my last scrap run was uh, an entire car full of aluminium chips and a few buckets of aluminium drops. So I have two questions about bouldering. From Nick Anderson Co. Tell me about your rock climbing. Do you only boulder? Do you like a top rope and lead? One of the reasons I like climbing is for the gadgets like Grigory and learning knots. I could see some technical like yourself also enjoying rope climbing for this reason. Do you watch any YouTube climbing channels? I wonder if you like the how not to break test videos. Yes, I like the how not to break test videos. Uh, if you don't know, that's a YouTube channel who is dedicated on breaking climbing equipment like carabiners or uh, hooks and stuff like that. Uh, very entertaining, built a hydraulic test fixture for tearing apart stuff. Super cool. I don't really watch, well, let's start at the beginning. I only do indoor bouldering at the point, uh, means up to four meters wall height, wooden structures and the walls are uh, coated with epoxy and sand to make them, to give, give them a lot of grip. Uh, it's like 80 grit sandpaper on a wall, uh, which has also a funny effect if you fall down uh, straight on the wall, you get cheese grated. But yeah, and then there are holes bolted to the wall with M10 screws or um, uh, drywall screws, wood screws if it's smaller footholds or larger wooden structure that gold gets bolted to the walls which are called volumes to change the overall shape of the wall. Those are also just uh, drywall screw, drywall screwed onto it or wood screwed. That's indoor bouldering. For those who don't know and you just climb without any um, without rope you just if you fall you fall like a few meters onto a very soft mat and if you don't fall down like on your head and uh, on your neck you usually don't get damaged doing that there are many ways to get damaged in bouldering uh, finger and hand injuries are very common so that that's the thing you have to be uh, very things can happen. It's a sport, it's a dangerous sport, like uh, you can fall down, you can snap, um, 
if you fall, if you ha are under full tension with your body strength and uh, you slip off with a finger, that can be extremely painful. But it's a very, the sport itself is, is an exercise in problem solving, body strength, and also um, um, being able to, to figure out movements. Not only finger strength, that's like, it helps if you if you have some strength, but the ability to move your body weight, your center of gravi gravity, understanding what happens if you if you move your feet to one side or the other below your center of gravity is very helpful. And you can do overhead climbing in a roof environment, uh, in, in, like upside down on your on your back climbing, and do not need to be. Uh, a muscle muscle man <laughs> so that that's all i do i do not do rock um, bouldering outside on on real rocks I, w I would like to try as far as i understand it's like 10 times harder than indoor on set routes but i want absolutely to try it and also i want to try uh regular rope climbing or sports climbing i think it's called not sure uh, but I have to do the there are two courses that you have to take to be certified for indoor rope climbing and also to learn everything but uh, I will I will do that and I want to do it but uh, bouldering goes very well I, I made a reasonable progress I'm like bouldering uh, 6a plus routes at this point in time uh, keep in mind that I started at age 35 and I'm, on, I'm basically an old fart and I didn't do any sports before that and uh, my body was like what the heck are you doing are you are you crazy you're doing sports now and uh, but <laughs> but my body adjusted to the to a very unusual load of bouldering and I go like three to four times a week for like two hours trying to solve climbing problems it's fun it's really fun it's, it's a very social uh, social experience too because you sit in front of a, a set route on the wall and you kind of try and then somebody else comes in and then you get to talk about uh, how to solve it or you just bitch about the route setter what uh, how much he was out of his mind when he built the route and then you just uh, well it, it's fun it's fun uh, I can highly recommend it I'm not a team sports person. I, I despise team sports because there is always so much competition in it. And uh, with bouldering, it's kind of a, it's also a, com a competitive, competitive sport. But for me, it's competitive with being uh, competitive with myself, pushing myself to get to solve harder and harder problems. So that, that, that's the big fun for me. And yes, I want to try other things too. But currently, it's all indoor indoor bouldering. Bob Luthier? I, I guess Bob is a Luthier by trade. <laughs> um, do you play a musical instrument? If so, which ones and what style? If not, have you ever given it any thought? No, I don't play any musical instrument. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm very incompetent in that regard. I don't have great, um, no talent basically. Uh, I would be interested in something like, I don't know, something. <laughs> uh, uh, a violin is very interesting to me, but as far as I understand, it's an extremely hard instrument to learn and master. So no, I don't play an instrument and currently I'm not planning to learn any. What is your main job and how, how you learn machining? And this is my main job. This is the shop is now my main job, but I guess we can go back. Um, I learned the trade of the mechatronics. Well, uh, Mechatronica, it's in German. It's a mechatronics technician, basically, or um, uh, it, it doesn't translate very well into into English. It's basically a mechanic and an electrician and a little bit of electronics and programming in one job crammed together, mainly intended for maintenance, industrial maintenance purposes. But I got in the lucky situation that 
um, well, I did my apprenticeship in 2005 to 2009. Then I was one year in the German army, in the Bundeswehr, doing my mandatory uh, nine months of service. Back in the time it was mandatory. Uh, six months later, they removed the mandatory service. Then I got back. I did one and a half years or two years in the lab, in a in a test lab for switch gear, socket, outlets, light switches and stuff like that, doing mechanical and electric endurance testing. Also built some of the test equipment there. Then I transitioned into the machine shop and prototype shop that belonged to the test labs. And I built test equipment there and did prototype machining. I learned CNC machining there. Uh, did my uh, did a, a CAD course for Pro Engineer and Creo. Well, back then it was Cre uh, Pro Engineer. Uh, learned CAM software there, and that's also the place where I got into first contact with Datron CNC routers. Did really a lot of parts on these machines, and uh, also manual mill, lathe, surface grinder, welding. Uh, building special machines, really a very universal job. But then I got the opportunity to change into prototype machine, in our, into our dedicated prototype shop, where I could run a Datron M10 full time for in for prototyping, and I did that for seven years, I guess, uh, which was programming fixture making, fixture building for, for those parts, machining, post-processing, um, quoting for time, internal quoting. And I learned so much during that time. I also learned to do like work on, on gauging. I did a lot of hard milling on the Daytron. It was very versatile and built proto uh, prototype punch and die tooling for prototype parts. Really, I learned a lot. I had a great foreman during that time who teach me a lot and I was very willing to accept what he what he had to teach me. Um, thank you, Herbert, wirklich. Um, and then I changed for the last two and a half years at Siemens, I changed into our special machine building division. They needed a machine builder an additional one, and uh, we build all our in-house production equipment ourselves. Mostly assembly, a little bit of um, manipulating, a lot of resistance welding machines, robotics. That's where I learned how to mount a thousand kilogram KUKA robot to the floor. Well, we d I didn't learn it, we, we figured it out ourselves. <laughs> we did a lot of sketchy rigging. I, we were a, an awesome team of very young people. Um, I was, with one exception, I was the oldest guy in the, on the mechanical side in the shop. Uh, my foreman was younger, the second foreman, uh, she, was, she was younger. And all the other colleagues were in their 20s. So a very young team and we worked extremely well together and it was really fun. Just I had a little bit of trouble with uh, the engineering behind some of the projects we worked on. And that also got me to, to finally to leave. So that's basically the story of me. That's my, that's my origin story if you want to make a movie about me. How do you judge the market for making parts with the use of metal processing machines being self-employed? I guess your business idea is to focus on small parts or stuff other shops don't want to do. What about making products for the end user like pen or razor? Uh, the, the last part of the question, the end user products, well, I make the precision bench stones. I have no interest in making gadgets like uh, pen, knives, razors. Uh, keychains and stuff like that. They, I leave that to people who are deeply into the uh, the gadget and EDC type environment. Uh, I don't use stuff like that myself, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to 
to make ga fidgets and gadgets. I want to make stuff that's um, in more interesting. Um, there are enough knife makers out there. I don't need to make a knife. Personally, I, I carry a, a Letterman Wave, and that should tell you my level of pragmatism about knives. Um, the the market in general, well, it seems that there is a market. When I um, many of the parts I I I work on are of a low enough quantity to be annoying to to a, a full on CNC shop that's mostly CNC. But sometimes also I get parts that need different processes, like a combination of stuff. Um, milling then manual deburr because the parts are so fragile and then maybe um, forming like bending or pressing and uh, the more additional processes you add the more value can give to the customer if he doesn't ha if you can deal with gold plating because you have a gold plating um, shop at hand that can that that you work with uh, that's very useful to the customer. Uh, I don't want to compete with a shop that has multiple vertical machining centers in a, a large space and has very efficient at making five axis parts very fast. Uh, I, I'm, I'm specializing in the oddball. Not, 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 not only small parts, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with doing larger parts too as far as my machines can deal with it. Um, I have made fairly big parts in here. From from my day job, I'm used to working with extremely tiny parts, but also with uh, really big parts on on milling machines. So that's not that's uh, not a limiting factor. It's just that my machines are a little bit more capable on the small part side. So. Uh, I'm kind of specializing uh, on prototyping, also on helping the customer if he wants to iterate on his design, giving, giving recommendations on design for manufacturer, change this, change that to make it cheaper, A recommendation on processes, on materials. Just be, <laughs> uh, be the extended workbench of an engineer. That's kind of what I like to be. So there were, there were questions about uh, how I plan to grow and if I want to grow the shop, if I want to have a larger space, uh, employees, and just how I see my future. So uh, there is a, a clearly nope on the employees because I was an employee myself and I know that employees can be horrible and I don't want to, uh, to have to deal with that and I, l I like to work on my own to be honest. Um, as far as the shop and uh, the business growth is concerned, I want to grow it very, very naturally uh, without any debt. I'm extremely risk averse. I'm, I'm buying machines only if I have the money. Every machine that I have, including the rather expensive surface grinder and the Decal FP1, I paid cash and I want to keep it that way. I know that there are good points in having debt, but I prefer not to have. I have thought about renting a bigger space at some point in time, but to be honest, uh, I own this place here, the, the house and the, the property. The property is 1800 square meters big, so it's, it's not tiny. I already laid it out. I can add on like seven meters in this direction to the shop. And I have pretty good access to the property with, uh, with a all-terrain forklift, for example, if I want to bring in a heavy machine. Uh, machines that can pallet jacked, that's easy. Um, heavier machines, that would be a kit, for example, if I ever decide to buy a vertical machining center, uh, that would be a case for a all-terrain forklift or I had to have to pave the entire property, which I would prefer not to because uh, there is enough pavement in the world already. Uh, renting a space um, where I'm currently now from from a business standpoint would be silly. I have everything in here that I need. The space is not limiting me at all. 
I have to dance around stuff like some around machines and items sometimes because uh, it's not a huge space, but it's uh, this, this space is very cheap to upkeep. It's relatively small, so I can heat it. Uh, very affordable. I don't have to pay rent because it's my it's mine. And well, a little bit of electricity that I need. It's it's reasonable. Mina. Fly cutting, is it worth the effort? Are the benefits apart from aesthetics over just stepping over with an end mill? Fly cutting being a single a single point cutting action. It's it's one it's a it's basically a large end mill with one flute. It introduces very little force into your setup and in the workpiece and also into the machine. So deflection in the machine is relatively small. So you get a very good result with fly cutting usually from a geometric standpoint. Also the surface finish is usually quite good because uh, fly cutters are generally hand sharpened tooling or machine sharpened tooling with a very keen and sharp cutting edge compared to say a face mill with a molded insert that creates a lot of uh, cutting pressure to to take a chip. That said, fly cutters are very uh, susceptible to errors in the tram of the machine of course. If let's say you're cutting in the x direction of your machine uh, and the head is slightly tilted to one side out of tram, uh, you will get uh, a scalloped surface. It, it will be concave, means hollow. Uh, how much? That depends on how much it is out of tram and how large of a diameter you're using uh, the cutter. So in some cases when you're skeptical about the tram of your machine or you require a really high precision flat surface, um, stepping over with an, end, with an end mill might be the better solution. Even further, uh, stepping over with a ball end mill that's uh, a full half round profile on the underside, uh, that will give you also an incredible flat surface because you're using an extremely small step over and any tram error of the machine will not have any influence. You're basically single line cutting with an end mill. Uh, almost as if you were using a shaper with a radius tool and stepping over. Uh, if you don't 100% understand what I mean, just sketch yourself the cross section of the workpiece and the end mill and what happens if you tilt the end mill to one side. Uh, if you do flat end mill and you do your step over to create a flat surface, even if the machine is out of tram, yes, it will get you like a sawtooth shaped surface, but the overall surface will be flat. So uh, that's a solution to work around a machine that's not perfect. R. Vandenbrand. Hi, Stefan. I recall one post on Zerspannungsbude. That's a German forum about machining, hobbyist forum. You mentioned selling the Gir Girardi machine vices. Why did you sell, sell them and what are you using now? I mean, thanks, Richard. So uh, the, the Girardi vices, I bought two of them, actually. I bought one from Girardi and one rebrand from Holex. And um, well, that was kind of an experiment and it didn't go too well for me. The devices in general are good, but they have their quirks. They have these angled uh, jaws that under pressure move down and pull the work onto the parallels, which works within limitations. The, the Gerard devices tend, well, to, to make those jaws work, you have to apply a certain amount of uh, clamping pressure. To, to have the, the jaws move down on, it, on the inclined plane. And for many parts that I do, this movement, the, the axial force was too high. Uh, so I would either deform the work pieces from clamping pressure or I could not get the jaws to move under clamping pressure. You can also set the jaws in a rigid mode, then the, they are fixed and don't move on the inclined plane. But then you have to deal with jaw lift from the moving jaw. And it just makes it really hard on small parts to get very accurate results. At least I could not make them work 
uh, very well for what I did. They have their, they have huge advantages. You can take off the moving jaw extremely fast, and then you have a large T slot section where you can uh, add other things to. I, I for example, I bolted the the rotary table directly onto the vice body if I needed the the rotary table. Uh, that worked quite well, but the drawbacks when working with small parts were were too much of a problem for me. So I sold both of them to other people who work on larger stuff. And what I use these days, grinding vices. I have uh, my main, all, all, pretty much all the vices I have on, on my machines are either grinding vices or self-centering vices from Garant. Let's, let's have a look in, a, in, in, in the shop. So we have either this style of vice on, on my machines, uh, grinding vice. With the, with the angled screw pulling the, the moving jaw down and against the workpiece. There are people who will tell you that these are not meant for or not suitable for machining on. Milling machines are only for grinding and inspection. That's hogwash. That's completely <sighs> These vices uh, with an M6 screw you get about uh, 750, well uh, a little pop home was that uh, so you get about seven kilonewtons of force between the jaws, which is very, which, uh, which uh, quite, quite quite good. The weight equivalent would be about seven hundred kilograms of force between the jaws. Uh, it's not, Herman. Uh, these are not for roughing, of course. Uh, they don't like work pieces that are not parallel or sawn surfaces. Uh, but they are super accurate. I have a bunch of them. There is a spare one up here in the shelf. And over here I have a bigger one. Uh, all of these are imports, relatively cheap import one. That's an 80 millimeter, 80 millimeter wide. Is it? Uh, 90 millimeter wide version from Arc Euro Trade in the UK, and that's technically my main vice. This goes either on the rigid table of the Decal FP1 or onto the faceplate that goes on the indexing head. Uh, this setup here is a small 50 millimeter vice on an Aerova chuck. So you can take this out. And I can walk over to the CNC and drop it in here, and I have a, and I can swap the Ys back and forth. Maybe even with a part, I can do some CNC work on here and take it over to the manual machine and, for example, do an angled hole with the tape with the head of the mill tilted. So that, that's quite a nice setup. And the Aerova chuck here just has a straight 40 taper shank that goes into the indexing head. And the other kind of vise that I use are these. Uh, these are self-centering vices from Garant. They call them uh, X-Trick. Here is the number if you want to know. And they have this nifty quick change system for their jaws. They have a dovetail here and some leaf springs back here. And you just hook the jaws on here and clip them in place. Of course, you do this twice. And then you have your self-centering vise. And these, for example, are gripper jaws. They have this serration and they will bite into the material uh, without pre-stamping. And have a def grip on uh, very little engagement on the material. This is nice for bands on material. And the jaws, of course, flip around for enlarging the work area. So, really, really nice vices. Um, not cheap. Uh, the body of these, is, so the, the body without the jaws is like 600 euros, 500 euros, something like this. They show up on the used market surprisingly often, I'm not sure why. And the jaws are like 150 euros a pair. I use them on a manual machine and on the, on the CNC. And I also want to make an adapter so I can put one on the, on the spindle of my lathe uh, to hold odd work 
directly with a vise on the spindle. Alan asked, hi Stefan, I wonder whether it's possible to say something about your journey through the machines you have acquired and released to other owners. Which were good decisions, which were not so good. What have you learned? What advice do you have? Um, uh, pretty bad advice, I guess. I remember that you that at some point in time you said I would never buy a deckle and many years later you said I just bought a deckle every one. I ask because this is one of the most tricky questions for amateurs and possibly pro professionals to navigate. I don't know whether that's an interesting subject for you. I, I, I guess that's, that's uh, generally uh, a tricky question and most likely an interesting question too. So let's go very quickly through the machines that I have. I will try to include pictures of all of the machines that I have or had. I started out with a 7x12 mini lathe, one of those super cheap import machines that you could pick up in the home improvement store. Uh, I got mine from the local Bauhaus store, uh, dragged it home super proud and learned how to do turning on this machine and I got excellent, I got really good results. I had very basic knowledge about machining from, from, from school. I had to do a practicum at, at a company and we did uh, machining there, milling and turning to learn the basics. And so I already had a basic fundamental knowledge of what's going on. And also my dad being a tool and die maker uh, also showed me things. But in general, he let me just figure it out on my own until I asked something. So um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so I had the mini lathe for a very long time and uh, dad brought home a, a drill press from Aldi at one point in time. One of those tiny um, belt driven 350 watt drill presses with a keyed chuck and so uh, I was al already set with turning and making holes in flat parts. Everything else was filing and hack sawing if I needed something uh, non-round. Non also, I learned that a lathe can do a little bit of milling if you add uh, a vise to it or a vertical slide. Or you can do a lot of things with a four-jaw independent chuck. Very much like the traditional model engineers in Great Britain. Then I tried to f add milling capabilities to my shop. I built myself a small horizontal milling machine. Not sure why I went for horizontal, but at the time I, I was very obsessed with, um, with horizontal boring machines, large, large scale horizontal boring machines. That are, that's the kind of machine that's always very appealing and very interesting to me because they are extremely large machines, but they are capable of doing fairly integrated work. And so I built a desk sized version out of uh, welded structural steel and added a, a compound slide. I will try to add, find a picture, but uh, I think it's all lost in time. I built my own spindle for it. That was the first spindle that I built myself with a 20, uh, with a ISO 20 taper. I made a, a small collet chuck for it that worked on, on a good lathe. And that way I just had at least a little bit of milling capability. Then I purchased a, a mill drill, basically uh, one of those machines that has a cross cross table round column and uh, a belt drive for the spindle. Uh, it was the lowest end version without a fine down feed and without anything but it got me very far. It, it was a very good drill and it could do a little bit of milling, fly cutting, the saw blade work, worked quite well in it. So I had that for several years and then on eBay I found a horizontal milling machine, a tool room milling machine actually, like a, like my decal milling machine, but just in terrible condition without a vertical head. Bought it for 400 euros and um, had it delivered and took it apart, took it in the basement, cleaned it all up over months, put it together and used it. First I started to use it as a horizontal milling machine and then I purchased a vertical head of a Wabeco milling machine with an ISO 30 spindle. I uh, botched that onto the machine and suddenly I had a vertical spindle tool room milling machine, uh, which was a very universal machine. It had a tilting and 
uh, swiveling table. The, the spindle head was quite good. Uh, and that got me very far. And at the time I was thinking that CNC would be cool. So I got a, a rack of an engraving machine without the pantograph, just the machine frame, which is a table that's moving up and down and XY slide. I converted it to CNC using the other tool room milling machine, uh, made all the accessories, all the uh, modifications to, to put uh, ball screws in it. Later I added gas scales. I run it, ran it with Linux CNC with feedback of the linear scales into the controller. That was one of the very early machines on the internet uh, shown that had linear scales and stepper drives and had full positional feedback for precision uh, positioning, which worked quite well. There are problems with steppers and uh, um, linear scale feedback, but it worked in the end quite well. So uh, I went through different milling machine spindles for that thing. In the end, it had a 40 taper high speed head of a Decal FP2 milling machine. Uh, that worked quite well. It had tiny travels, 250 by 100 and something millimeters XY. At the time, I sold the other tool room milling machine because uh, it didn't. F it felt obsolete to have two machines that were kind of the same. So that's also kind of the starting time when I started with YouTube. Then I purchased the Decal G1L. Aha! Uh -huh, wait, I bought an Alif in that time frame too. I bought the machine I had before the M code. It's a it's basically a 10 by 20 inch, uh, 250 by 550 millimeter import lathe from Hobby M in the Netherlands. It's import machine, belt drive, very, very simple machine. Had had a feed gearbox for, for uh, screw cutting. And that machine served me many, many years very well. I built, for example, a harmonic drive fourth axis for the, for the CNC. Uh, with a lot of precision fits into each other and that that was kind of a, my, my <laughs> uh, uh, one of one of the more complex proje projects that I built and that lathe worked quite well and I did a full rebuild to learn some things on it I I did the the surface the, the bearing epoxy the muglis on all the machine slides I did scraping on it Things like that. Just may, try to make it a way better machine than it was supposed to. I uh, had that for many years. Worked quite well. Then I purchased the Deckel G1L engraving machine because um, I'm not sure how that came about. I think I saw brochures about the, the pentagraph machines and I was really interested in how they work and how you operate them to get good results. So I got one. At this point, this is still hobby mostly with a little bit of YouTube. So I got the, the G1L engraver and I started the started to, to accumulate accessories for it and did projects on the machine and learned a lot of things on it. I used it for micro milling because it had a 20,000 RPM spindle. At the time, I learned that on a manual milling machine, you don't need very high speed to do micro milling in the process of, of doing that. Uh, the, the danger of burning up the cutter on a manual machine when you go extremely slow because you, you are the servo for the axis is extremely high. So uh, don't get all fed up about high speed spindles on manual machines if you, if you can help it. Uh, there are cases when a high speed spindle on a manual machine is useful, especially for uh, drilling. But in general, you can you get very far with a spindle that runs 2,000 to 5,000 RPM. You don't need 25,000 RPM. Um, so I learned a lot of things with that with that machine, and then I sold it once again. And I also sold the CNC. I sold the CNC, and I purchased the Optimum, the the large bench milling machine that I have, basically an RF45, as it's known all around the world. And um, I purchased that machine. I, I sold the CNC because I wanted a larger work envelope and just a more universal machine. I used the heck out of that machine. 
it made a ton of parts and at that time time i also started to do customer projects customer parts and the optimum milling machine always served me well for that purpose sometimes it was a struggle to get the precision that i required out of it i for example on one part i, I had to use a jack screw be between the wall and the vertical column to bend the column in a little bit to get the perfect tram in a certain situation things like that um, i learned a lot with that machine again it's, it's always each machine that i purchased was kind of up to this point was kind of out of curiosity and because i wanted to learn not because i wanted the best machine so yeah then i sold the decal engraver because i was interested in tool grinding <laughs> then i purchased the knut tool and cutter grinder and this was a bad purchase this was really not a good machine it's like it's, it's uh, um, I think the technical term for this machine is cluster f In theory, it would be a good machine from its general layout. Uh, all the, the kinematic layout of it is quite good, but uh, it was just not well made. Everything on it was very crudely made, and I put a lot of work into it to make it better and better and work more uh, a little bit better each time I use it and in the end I, I did quite a bit of tool grinding on it I did some customer project grinding on it but but I kind of got sick of it. <laughs> it it was more of a project that I wasn't willing to deal with anymore so uh, I sold that to a friend who hopefully will ever finish it and at the same time I purchased the surface grinder well kind of same time I'm, I'm mixing up my time frame here a little. I bought the LIP 515 surface grinder because I wanted a little surface grinder because I wanted to learn more about surface grinding. I had done a little bit grinding at large young HF50 surface grinders at my day job, but usually it was only flat grinding and nothing like uh, grinding slots or cylindrical grinding. So purchased that and I learned a ton about grinding uh and uh it, i i had this grinder for a very long time too and i don't want to be without a surface grinder anymore since then i replaced the hobby m lathe my old rebuilt lathe with the mco super 11 that i have to this day because i wanted a machine that had a truer running spindle not uh run out related but roundness uh the roundness of the parts and bores that i made became a problem with the hobby m machine because the bearing arrangement well the bearing arrangement was fine but uh the the spindle the the precision in the, in the spindle housing and spindle itself was just not there to get the desired precision and and roundness out of parts that are required for some projects so i purchased the emco used from from an old person and uh, that, that was a very lucky shot because the machine was basically unused. It had a few hours on it, uh, some brass chips, but I couldn't find any steel chips in the machine when I got it. Uh, it's really in good condition and since then I use it and it, it has really been a very good machine. The, uh, let's see, next machine. Then I purchased the Decal S1 tool and credit grinder because I still like the concept of having a tool and cutter grinder, but the Knut was just not the right machine for me. The Knut being a universal cutter grinder with the T-slotted table that you bolt all your accessories to it was extremely annoying to change over between um, different operations. The Decal S1 tool and cutter grinder, on the other hand, is a dedicated tool and cutter grinder. It's not universal. You don't do surface grinding or cylindrical grinding on that machine. It is only tools and um, it has been very much of a learning experience but it, it's a good machine and uh, I don't plan to get rid of it currently. But that was also more of a I want to learn more purchase instead of a, bi a wise business decision. <laughs> then I got the, the surface grinder, the Bema 260 surface grinder that was a business decision i needed a surface grinder that was not worn out like my lip 515 
had some scraping to the lip and the, the table ran very straight but the, the, the geometry in the crosswise was a little bit off and also very very much worn so uh, after some back and forth between different machines um, the Bima was was an idea a new lip Mac machine was was uh, I was thinking about and also a 6x18 import machine uh, the 6x18 was ruled out very quickly because those are darn heavy and big machines uh, I also was looking at an Okamoto 350, the used machines, but also darn heavy. And this side of the shop where I have the grinders has a concrete ceiling and there is a, well, there's a bunker underneath. And um, I don't want to overstrain the ceiling in here. I don't, the plans of this house don't state a maximum load of this floor. So I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to go self with all of the stuff so i'm not going to put another one ton machine in here so got the bima surface grinder i never really spoke about that machine i think i got it i i was i saw this machine years ago at a trade show and i didn't pay much attention apart from it being an extremely cute machine and uh that was it then it was in the back of my mind for years when, when I was looking at the new machine this came up so I uh, talked to the people drove there looked at the machine in their facility where they built them and also we went to a customer of them who had three of these a tool and die shop and I could do a little bit of test grinding and well I purchased it it was really an expensive machine but uh, surface grinders are kind of a primitive machine there are three axes, three, three movement, three uh, linear slides and a grinding spindle with one motor. So a manual surface grinder, there is not much that can break. It's kind of a, uh, one of the machines for my Mad Max Apocalypse uh, loadout. So that's surface grinder. That was a clear business decision to get this machine. Um, the large drill press the optimum drill press I always wanted to have a large drill press I'm used to have large drill presses at my day job we usually had Altsmetall AB3 machines in various configurations and it's just nice to have a large drill press so that's kind of a support machine for me I use a tapping head in it a lot just for drilling stuff Sometimes to make a whole drill press is the simplest way. So that, that was the idea behind it. And I also thought when I buy a drill press, I don't want to deal with buying another drill press ever again. So I got the biggest machine that I could fit in here reasonably well. That said, I still would like to have a radial arm drill press. Uh, then I had kind of a midlife crisis and I wanted a two-room milling machine <laughs> again I had one back in the day and I wanted one again um, not sure if that was a good business decision but since I'm very used to the, the two-room milling, lay, milling machine layout I think it was a logical decision to buy one finally. When I was a hobbyist, I would not have bought one because replacement, part, replacement parts for these machines are horrendous expensive. On the business side of things, the positive is that I can get replacement parts for it. If the head on this machine craps itself, I can, I can, I, it's, a, it's a five hour drive back and forth to get a new head for this machine. I rebuilt one from FPS, Singer, Harich or Arnold. Not a, not a big deal then. Also the, the accessories for this machine, like the slotting head. Oh, speaking of the slotting head, also I had the Shaper. Um, when I had the uh, I purchased the Shaper also because I was very interested in the machines and uh, just wanted to have a, sl uh, a Shaper and this this was also kind of a machine that uh, that teach me a lot about the machining process process itself how chips are created how the influence of a cutting edge on the surface finish and what you can do to to play with the surf with the with the finish. 
but also I sold it shortly after I got the surface grinder because the surface grinder kind of replaced the shaper for me. I often used the shaper to get a very good finish on parts and the surface grinder is good at that too. So uh, shaper goes, surface grinder stays. That's that. But back to the tool room milling machine. Oh boy, this is super uh, disjointed uh, storytelling here. So tool room milling machine. I sold the old optimum milling machine to, to my former foreman and I got a Deckel FP1. The Deckel FP1 is just a very good tool room milling machine that I can basically use for a lot of applications. I can use it as a mill, as a slaughter. It's a, a good drill. A good precision drilling machine, just universal. It has a horizontal spindle. If I ever have to do uh, kind of large work pieces, I can remove the table if I have to do boring or milling on, on large or long stuff. So that, that's a very good combination machine, a very good universal tool room milling machine. That's what it says in the manual of the machine. Um, so often when I got machines, it was because I wanted, was interested in them. Uh, less about uh, wise decisions. On the CNC machine side, it's different. It's, it was always a little bit different. I got, um, so I had this converted engraver with the 40 taper spindle and I sold that in favor of the old benchtop milling machine. But I very quickly realized that I need a CNC machine just for productivity's sake. So I got from a friend the easel CNC router. I used that for a fair bit of time and then I wanted something bigger. Uh, purchased the Sorotech CNC router. That was the, the, the second to last machine that I got. Uh, it was the aluminum frame machine with the high-speed spindle and this machine paid extremely fast for itself. I had a lot of very well paying job on, jobs on that machine and uh, the, the machine paid for itself in like uh, half a year or a year. And then I had the opportunity to buy the, uh, this machine next to me, the epoxy granite machine. And the, um, which the thought behind it is because this machine can do steel and hard milling quite well and I also put the HSK spindle which is a very fast manual tool change on it. Uh, the idea behind that machine was this is a very good companion to the DECL FP1 machine since both of them are capable of machining steel and all other materials below or that are easier than steel. The, this machine is extremely good at, it's a very productive machine I, I noticed because it's very fast moving, it has fairly small travels but it's extremely rigid for its size. Uh, it's almost as good as these. That was a joke. <laughs> that was really a joke. Um, it's still a stepper driven machine with a, a hobby grade CNC control but it's extremely capable for what I need. And despite having a cardboard enclosure, it, closure, I'm very happy so far with it. Uh, for those who ask, yeah, I'm going to keep this overall shape and the door design on the this, on this CNC router or CNC mill. I don't hate it. I like it so far and it works for me. So uh, this machine was very much of a business decision too to get it. Uh, I put a lot of hours into it to get it ready. Uh, a lot of late nights here in the shop. Uh, a lot of late nights with me, the machine, wiring layout and watching Star Trek. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that this is one of my, this is a very important machine currently. Between, if I had to tell you the most important machines, uh, number one is always a lathe for me. A lot of stuff that I make starts out as a round part. And then, I hate to say it, but it's the CNC mill, the second most productive machine in here. CNC mill is almost always the second step after the lathe. Sometimes I'm going from the lathe to the manual mill if it's just like a cross hole, a wrench flat or 
a slitting saw work, for example, or if, if uh, I need to do slotting. But most of the time, if it's more than just a flat, it goes on the CNC. So, and then, of course, there is the support equipment like the bandsaw, the hardness tester, TIG welder, uh, the bit grinder. I love support equipment. Support equipment is what makes a shop capable. Every shop has a mill and a lathe and a CNC and maybe a surface grinder. But the support equipment like a hardness tester gives you added, added capabilities. The debit grinder enables you to, to modify tooling on a very small footprint if I ever put mine back together. Uh, relieving and necking down end mills to reach down into into deep uh, pockets on, on the CNC. The drill bit grinder is also a piece of uh, support equipment. Do you need a drill grinder in a machine shop? I don't think so. Is it useful? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you burned up your last 4.2 millimeter drill on a Saturday evening and you have a, a project that needs to be shipped on Monday, you will be very happy that you can recreate a almost factory regrind within a few seconds on a, a drill grinder. Things like an ultrasonic cleaner, being able to clean parts very well for shipping. Uh, customers appreciate if, if there are no chips left in and, and bores and parts and if they are degreased and everything is clean. Sorry Sam. Or things like the NSK die grinder, that's also support equipment. It's right here. NSK die grinder and NSK belt sander. Uh, two pieces of support equipment that I use on a daily basis to work on customer parts, to do final touches, deburring, blending, or having a microscope. Microscope also, very useful piece of technology in a shop. No matter if it's an optical or a uh, video microscope, just uh, it, it helps you to see more <laughs> of what you're doing. Even, even a simple uh, 7x magnification um, eye loop like uh, watchmakers or jewelers have. Extremely useful. So I hope this disjointed rant gave you an idea over all of the machines that I had and the reasoning why I had them. Not all of them are very reasonable decisions. Well, uh, kind of, most of them were very unreasonable decisions. Uh, Joel asks, hi Stefan, do you ever have cause to need roughness testers to ensure compliance with surface finish requirements. Cheers. Uh, yes. I had the case where I needed to be able to check the surface roughness and also uh, it's good to have a general idea what surface roughness is that you create um, that plays back into gaining experience as a machinist in general. So I do not have a dedicated roughness tester, unfortunately. It's on my list of things to purchase, but that's like a 5,000 euro invest. Uh, that's in the same price category as the TESA height, height gauge. Um, what I'm currently doing is I'm, I'm using these and a microscope. These are surface roughness normals or reference plates. Uh, these are old, made in the uh, uh, made in Germany in the GDR. Uh, they come in different technologies. This one is for uh, drehen, which is turning, and I also have uh, a set for cylindrical grinding, Rundschleifen, and. Uh, Flachschleifen, which is surface grinding. And you basically, you look at them and this one is for example uh, surface roughness RC 3.2 micron. And on the back side it gives you uh, all the, the alternative uh, to RC. We ha it's, it's equivalent to an RA of 0.5 micron or an RP of 1 micron. These are the actual measured values. So it says RC 3.2 in front here because that's 
about what it is, but back here you have the actual measured values. 3.5 RC, uh, 0.51 RA and 1 micron RP. And it also tells you uh, which tool was used to do this, to do this cut, uh, which um, carbide uh, grade of carbide and the radius of the cutting tool, which is 4.5 mm, uh, a 0 0.4 millimeter radius, and it also gives you the cutting data, um, a depth of cut of 30 microns, a feet of 80 microns per revolution, and um, a surface um, surface speed of 250 meters per minute to create this surface and this goes up to all the way up to um, 80 microns RC which is extremely rough I think you can see how coarse of a finish this is and the way I use these I, I look under them at the microscope and I put the part that I want to compare to it next to it and then I take a extremely good guess at what I have. Uh, this is very dangerous. Don't do that to customer parts if you can, uh, if you don't have to. Um, there is also people who do a calibrated fingernail, scratch this, scratch that and compare how it feels, which is even more dangerous than comparing under the microscope. But at least you get a rough idea of what's going on. So a real surface roughness tester, of course, has a small stylus that's dragged along the surface and it records uh, a depth or a height profile. Watching. <laughs> Thanks for all the people who have chimed in with questions. And um, well, I, I hope uh, some of the answers were helpful or interesting or funny or entertaining or whatever. I know this is was a very long format video. I I, I usually try not to do talking head only videos. I try to put a little bit of uh, added value in them. The next video will be machining uh, an, an actual part again, customer part. It's almost done editing. So, um, well, new year, Let, let's try to make the best out of it. Make make parts, make make a difference. Try to be try to be a decent human being. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back. Bye.